question. The next question is also a great question to ask. That question is, well, what difference does what you're saying make in your life? Or, so what? Everybody try that with me. So what? Ooh, students with attitudes, I like it. <laughs> and then finally, the last question is also a great question. It's based on Pascal's wager. So you might know who Pascal was. Who was he? Yes, sir. He was a mathematician. He was a French mathematician, but we won't hold that against him. Anyway, <laughs> he was not only a mathematician. What did he discover, by the way? Do you remember what he discovered? Laws of probability. If you've studied the law of probability, you have studied Pascal. But he was not only a great mathematician, he was also a great philosopher. He was a Christian philosopher. And he kind of came up with this bet, this wager. He said, if I as a Christian am wrong about there being a God, then all I've done is live my life by a set of rules out of a book that has provided nothing but good and benefit for mankind. And when I die, that's all there is. But if you as a non-Christian are wrong about there not being a God, and you die, are you willing to suffer the consequences? Pretty good wager, is it not? Well, boiled down, it comes down to one simple question. And that question, of course, is, well, what if you are wrong? What if you are wrong? Well, these are the four questions. Very easy to learn. What's the difficult part? Using them wisely. Now, everyone in here knew these questions instinctively when you were two years old. You just knew them in the form of one word. What was that word? Why? Why? And by the time you were four, your parents had beaten it out of you. They were so tired of hearing it. So I'm not giving you anything new. I'm just teaching you the same question in a more sophisticated form. But again, the difficult part is not learning the questions. The difficult part is using them wisely. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go out and we're going to practice using the questions. We're going to go out and we're going to interview a humanist and an atheist. We are going to interview a humanist and an atheist. We are going to interview a humanist and I teach you the questions and you don't use the questions. You're all looking at me going, Bill, you're such a nice guy. <laughs> I don't care who's standing before you. I don't care if it is your best bud. I don't care if it's your pastor. I don't care if it is Dan Rather off the CBS Evening News. Oops, he is off the CBS Evening News. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care who it is that's standing before you. You need to be asking the question. If not asking it verbally, you need to be at least what? Thinking of the question to ask. Yeah. You need to be asking the questions, okay? Well, uh, you tell me, what is a humanist? What is a humanist? Someone who's human. Okay, we'll start with that. Let's work with it. Let's work with it. Who's, what's a humanist? Yes. Uh, well, there are, generally they would, they would say that, let's put it in a little different way. Can you state that a little differently? Instead of saying that they say there's no God, what, what would they say is supreme? Man is supreme. Man is, a supreme, is the supreme being in the universe. Okay? So normally we would say not only are they humanistic, they're also what? Atheistic as well. Now there is such a thing as a Christian humanist, Right? You've heard the term. That's, that's kind of like a, you know, what, what's that called? Oxymoron, right? An oxymoron, okay? It's like black light. <laughs> Dry ice. Jumbo shrimp. <laughs> so we got an oxymoron here. So a Christian humanist is an oxymoron. But generally, humanists not only believe that man is supreme, but they also deny anything that is what? supernatural as well, okay? So then, what about the two questions that any good worldview will attempt to answer? What is the nature of? God. What's the nature of? Okay, we've already answered the nature of God, that He is non-existent at worst or irrelevant at best. But what about the nature of man? Is He good, inherently good, or inherently flawed? He's inherently good. So then what do you do about um, right and wrong? 
How does a humanist determine what is right and wrong? You know, when I got here this evening, uh, the fire marshal met me outside. He said, Bill, he said, I'm not sure that you have enough room in the meeting room to meet the fire code. You have to have so many square feet per person. He said, would you mind taking this tape measure and measuring the room and calculating the square footage? He said, I have to run off to a fire or something. So I said, okay, I'll do that. So I went in, measured the room, calculated the square footage, and then I thought, you know, because I'm an old bonehead English teacher, maybe I better get somebody to check my figures. So I got my good buddy, Tim. And Tim took the tape measure, he measured the room, he calculated the square footage, and he came up with an entirely different set of figures than I did. So we looked at each other. We thought, we better get somebody else. So we got Carl. Now, why we got Carl, I don't know. But we got Carl. He measured the room. He calculated the square footage. And he came up with an entirely different set of figures than either Tim or I did. And you know what? For the life of me, I can't figure out why in the world we all came up with different <laughs> figures for the room. What's the problem here? It stretches, yes. It's zesty stretchy. Would you use my yardstick to build a building. If you do, don't invite me in the front door. <laughs> and yet the humanist says that we can build a civilization by each person deciding for himself what is right and what is. Can you build a culture using that as a yardstick? Everybody look at me and say, no. Well, we're going to interview this humanist and we're going to interview an atheist. We're going to start off with what I consider to be a great spiritual conversation starter. We're going to ask the question, what happens when you die? Now, how many possible answers are there to that question? Two, somebody said. How many possible answers? Many? Who said many? Lots, somebody said. I like it when somebody's specific like that. How much did you eat it at supper tonight? Lots. <laughs> Hun, how much did you spend at the mall? Lots. <laughs> I am looking for a specific number. Well, let's name them. Let's name all the possibilities there can possibly be on the question of what happens when you die. What's one possibility? Nothing. Nothing. You die, you rot, you stink, and become extinct. What's another possibility? Yeah. Heaven or hell. Hebrews 9, 27. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. Okay, what's another possibility? Some form of reincarnation. Now, there are variations on a theme, right? But those are the three. Now, by the way, is there any other possibility? Can anybody think of another possibility? Annihilation is extinction, okay? Purgatory, now that's an interesting one, but purgatory is merely a stopping off place between heaven or hell, so you're still stuck with three. Now there's another one that people sometimes come up with. Pardon me? A spectral realm. <laughs> what, what, what do you mean by that? A ghost, okay, but ghost really is a form of what? Reincarnation. It's really kind of a holding tank until usually what happens? You get to go on to whatever you go on to, right? Or you get reincarnated. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a nebulous position. It's not one that you can hold consistently. So you're still stuck with three, but there's another one. Yes? Well, that's a form of reincarnation. You get to become your own god. Well, that's if you're a good Mormon boy. You get, you get to go rule your own planet, right? Dude, not bad. I get to be a god and I get to rule a planet. Where do I sign up? But if you're a good Mormon girl, then maybe the good Mormon boy gets to invite you to the planet and, and you get to be eternally morning sick. <laughs> You know, I never understood how they sold that one, you know? But they do a good job, don't they? Okay? It's a form of reincarnation for them. There's another one. It, it's called Nirvana, okay? Now, what's Nirvana? I know it's a band. Kurt's dead, but never mind. Um, what is Nirvana? What's the idea of Nirvana? You join the ultimate. You join the ultimate, okay? What do you mean by that? You become, you become a drop in the ocean of consciousness, okay? Let's take this bottle of water out to the local body of water and let's dump it in, okay? 
Does this bottle of water retain its individuality, its distinctiveness, its personality? No. So it's what? Extinction. You're still stuck with what? Now, if you know all the answers to the question you're asking, will you be stumped by anything the person says? Everybody look, to me and look at me and say, no. What would be a logical follow-up question to whatever the person says happens when you die? What if you are and you die?